On this episode, we look at the Active Living Partnership in Orlando, Florida. Then we travel to Pinellas County, where improvements are going in on Highway 19. Greenville, South Carolina has won awards for their pedestrian improvements. Finally, we learn the latest on walkable community workshops. Stay tuned! We're in Orlando, Florida, talking with Ray Larson, who's the Executive Director of the Healthy Community Initiative. What is the initiative? The Healthy Community Initiative is a nonprofit organization here in Orlando, Florida. It's really about how do we bring our community together, give them the information they need to be intentional about the future. How do we make this a great place to live now, and how do we make it a great place to live in the future? And how long have you been around? Well, the, the initiative as a, as a nonprofit has been around about nine years, but it really began as kind of a community movement where about 300 people came together on a monthly basis for a year to talk about this community, what they loved about the community, what they saw as its challenges, and how to move forward. What have you been able to accomplish over the, well, I guess, almost a decade now? Well, we work in a couple of different areas. Uh, we've, we've really changed the discussion about children and youth in our community. We've moved that conversation from one that only focuses on their problems and issues to how do we make this a community where they really thrive. And the area that we're really becoming more involved in is how do you design, how do you make a community that contributes to the health, the well-being, the high quality of life for people that live there? And what's your connection with the Active Living by Design a Community Partnership? here in Orlando? Well, as you know, Active Living by Design is a project of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they've chosen 25 communities around the country, and the city of Orlando was one of those grantees. And so we act as a coordinating agency for the community partnership. We have a real unique, I think, community partnership in that it's not just planners and designers, or it's not just social services, but it's really a mixture of both of those disciplines working to see how we not only change the design of our community, but how do we encourage people to get out and use the things that we're trying to do in our community. And we're going on, I guess, almost a year into the uh, five-year uh, project. Uh, have you figured out what you're doing yet? Well, we, we figured out some things that we're doing. You know, and actually, some of the things we've figured out is that um, that we have some really good facilities and we have some places that really need to change. We've also figured out that, that we live in a culture now where, where, I know it sounds funny, but people don't always know how to ride their bikes. They may know how to keep their balance, but they don't know how to ride safely in a community. People don't know how to walk, and I know that even sounds sillier. Of course they know how to walk, but they don't know how to walk around to get to places. And oftentimes they don't realize how it is possible to get to some places. We've had a couple instances where people said, I didn't realize I could walk over to the supermarket. I just never have done it before. So we know that not only do we have to look at the built environment, but we also have to deal with those kind of preconceived or, or that culture that says that it's not easy to get around. And so one of the ways that we're going to do that is that we're going to involve a large volunteer base all on one day and make a, a big event of it. And they're going to go around and survey every single road within the Active Living by Design District in the city of Orlando. And they're going to they're going to be surveying for the type of road, the, how easy it is to cross the streets and those sort of things. And that's not only going to give us a lot of information and help us to prioritize the design features that maybe we have to deal with, but it's going to give us a constituency that, that really understands better um, and has some language to express that understanding about what they want and how they can be supportive of changing our community. How do you go about organizing uh, such a major effort? <laughs> well, we'll see at the end if we actually have accomplished it. But we've really begun with a very detailed map and, uh, and have, have broken out into individual segments. And a number of us have gone out and piloted it. How long does it take to do a segment? How many far can you get in about an hour and a half and that sort of thing? Then we count up all the segments. And one of the things that we're paying a lot of attention to is, is the volunteers that we gather. We're being very conscious of, of not just, for instance, getting our, our students from the University of Central Florida, although we want them to participate. But we're going to have seniors involved around our senior centers and the and the rec centers that they go to. We want to involve minorities. Um, we have a large Hispanic and Haitian community. We want to make sure that they're involved. We want to involve neighborhood associations. So we're being very intentional about making sure that that volunteer base we, we, we reach out to really reflects our community and reflects that constituency that we're trying to build in our community. You've done this survey. You've energized and activated and involved all these people. What do you see as the next step beyond that then? Well, we are going to have some formal things around. We're going to have a, an advisory committee to the city that we're going to look at every time we're building or retrofitting, make sure that we're building an active living principles into that. And there's going to be a community group that does that. Beyond that, though, we also realize that, that there are some 
cultural, economic status. There's, there's different things that play into why people don't go out. Some are around safety, for instance. Some are around the fact that our sidewalks don't necessarily go someplace that people need to go to. So we need to address all those type of issues, and we really want to change the culture of our community. We're in a beautiful place here in Central Florida, and, and I've had many occasions where people have said, well, there's no problem for you in Central Florida. People must you know, be out all the time. And, and certainly people are out, but, but not nearly as much as you would think. And for many parts of the country, they have to deal with when it's very cold out. Um, we have to deal with sometimes when it's very hot out and people don't want to go outside and, and where can they walk and, and where can get their activity. I come back at the end of five years. What do you hope to have accomplished? I hope to be skinnier. <laughs> and, and I really hope that when you come in, your, your experience is you're knowledgeable, so your experiences as you walk through our streets, that the streets are streets that encourage people to walk and encourage people to bike. But more importantly, I hope that as you walk through our neighborhoods, you see people walking and biking. And it's just part of living here, that, that being part of Central Florida community, being part of the city of Orlando is that, that we walk to places and we have beautiful places to walk and safe places to walk. We're in Pinellas County, Florida, talking with Commissioner Karen Seal. A few years ago, you were in charge of a task force. What was it? It was called the U.S. 19 Task Force, and it was created due to the number of deaths that were happening along this highway that we have here in Pinellas County. And what, uh, when you took a look at the deaths, uh, what, what sort of pattern did you see along Highway 19? Well, we saw several things, but one of which was that we had an inordinate amount of pedestrian and bicyclist deaths due to different factors, but in between the intersections and, um, and because there was a lack of sidewalks, we started to do an inventory there and found that there was a great need for sidewalks in order to keep the pedestrians and the bicyclists safer. So once the task force was formed, um, who was on it and, and how did you go about your business? We had 24 members, which most people said you'll never get anything done, and I had a mixture of people who were elected officials, business leaders, and um, just civic f folks who wanted to be engaged in the process. We set up su two subcommittees, of which I chaired both, with the idea of, again, taking what was happening along the roadway, analyzing the data, and then trying to come up with solutions, both long-term and short-term. Um, we studied, we accomplished this in a six month period of time. We also had two public hearings because I felt that it was very important to go to the public and say, you drive this road every, way, every day, so what are your safety concerns and what are your common sense solutions? And we actually used some of their solutions in, the, in, in what happened during the construction of, this, of the changes. So after the task force uh, finished its work, uh, what happened after that? It was me, myself, and me <laughs> who tried to work with our, we have a transportation board and staff, and they helped me tremendously in trying to move ahead and, and to make sure we implemented many of the things that were suggested. We had 66 ideas, and I would say about half the things have been implemented to date, uh, including uh, fewer bus stops along US-19, strobe lights on the buses. We have what they call channelized medians, so people don't go out and play chicken in a median um, and have a death happen because of that. We're in an area called Death Valley where a lot of the traffic accidents were happening, a lot of fatalities. We have a traffic light there installed now um, using, it was a public-private partnership that made that happen, and it's just been almost one step at a time trying to get th things accomplished. Um, we allocated uh, twenty million dollars towards finishing the sidewalks. We had thirty four miles of sidewalks that were incomplete. Um, basically, nineteen is thirty four miles long, so half of it on one side or the other was was not complete. So we were able to um, allocate the money and then start to get the engineering and design to make that happen and we're almost done. So four years later, I we also have channelized um, the medians complete. We've got two overpasses underway that we did not have um, underway before, and we have wayfinding signs so that people can look up an address in the phone book and the yellow pages, look to see what block it's at, and then try to um, 
plan their travel to either avoid 19 or to know approximately where the business is. On top of it, we have distinctive signs that are put every quarter of a mile so people are able to see the physical address at that point. So there's been many different things that have been implemented and we're just very pleased that the, the pedestrian, the sidewalk issue was one of the last things that we needed to have as far as our short-term solutions. Now this is a uh, U.S. Highway 19. Which layers of government do you have to work with in terms of uh, you know, county, state, federal? Who's, who's in charge? Uh, basically the state's in charge. Um, however, it is um, in the Federal Highway Act, but it's, it's not like an I-275 or an interstate. It's a U.S. highway, so it go, you go after different funding mixes. So I was very lucky because our two congressmen here, Congressman Bill Arrakis and Congressman Young, who incidentally has been chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. So that was very crucial in all of this. So we went forward with our long and short-term plans and they knew the media was very engaged and knew that there were solutions in sight and so they were able to um, bring some substantial financial dollars from Washington home to Pinellas County to help to make this happen. Now that some of the improvements are in place, the uh, address signs, the sidewalks, what sort of feedback are you getting from the public? The public is extremely pleased. They uh, f gave up basically on anything ever constructive happening along on 19. And it even goes back, I was born and raised here two years ago. Uh, there used to be bumper stickers that said, pray for me, I drive on US 19. Well, that's been that thought process over the many years, even though there were some improvements done um, over the years, this to most people seems like, okay, this is the answer. You know, this is where we're going. and they really see substantial progress being made and knowing that, that it's going to make their lives safer. And that's a good feeling. And US 19 continues on north uh, through Pasco County. Have other places picked up on what you're doing here? Uh, yes, Pasco County actually picked up on it. And um, I helped them to decide their, I, I could go in and say, here's what we did great, here's what we could have done better. Uh, here were the obstacles, and you know, here's how you work with the Florida Department of Transportation on getting your projects happening and approved and so on. Helped him um, suggest some makeup of their task force, um, suggested that they do it in a very similar fashion, gave them all of our workbooks and our ideas, and then I helped kick off their first task force meeting. Uh, they came back with many of the same solutions that we have um, put into place, and they are currently in, in the process of of making theirs happen too, to make it a safer place. We're in Greenville, South Carolina, talking with Dan Durig, who's the director of the Department of Public Works. A few years ago, the city won an award from America Walks for being pedestrian friendly. What's the city done to earn that distinction? Well, we've uh, put a lot of time and effort and money into making our community more pedestrian friendly. A uh, major program in sidewalks uh, is probably the keystone of that, of that effort. Uh, but we've also done things with pedestrian crossings, uh, improved signalization programs, uh, dealing with folks who have some disabilities who need some help, uh, as well as um, to uh, emphasize the importance of sidewalks and the fact and the recognition that those sidewalks really are the fabric which knit neighborhoods together and neighborhoods together make a fine city. And how has the sidewalk program progressed since you came on in the city? Well, I can, I can, I can give you roughly in the last four years because I know those numbers. Uh, we really have a two-pronged approach. One is to rehabilitate our existing system. It's about 120 miles of city sidewalk and we've been able to completely rehabilitate uh, just about 10 miles of that system. It doesn't sound like a lot uh, but when you're finishing sidewalk uh, and hands and knees a foot at a time, 10 miles is a, is a, is a good effort. Uh, we get rid of trip hazards and those sorts of things. Um, we also have a program we call the INSTEP program, which stands for Neighborhood Sidewalk Targeted Expansion Program. And that's an effort to bring sidewalks, brand new sidewalks uh, that have never existed before, into existing neighborhoods uh, for the purpose of um, connectivity, where we may have a block that's for some reason the sidewalk didn't go in originally. 
Um, it's a point system. It aims at uh, particularly servicing and getting a pedestrian sidewalk network around our schools, senior centers, uh, uh, special facilities where people typically walk to those facilities. And that effort has resulted, with this coming fiscal year, it'll be about five miles of new sidewalk retrofitted into existing neighborhoods that were built any time from, say, 1930 through about 1980. How well has it been accepted by the public? Well, people love it. Uh, when I first uh, joined the city about uh, eight years ago, almost nine now, uh, we had a series of community uh, meetings and we asked people, what is it you like about your city? What is it could be improved in your city? And where would you put some emphasis? And uh, very clearly coming out of those neighborhood meetings was a desire to put more and improve infrastructure in neighborhoods. And a big part of that infrastructure was sidewalks. Uh, people were recognizing that uh, uh, they wanted to live in neighborhoods where they knew their neighbors, uh, where they could go out and walk the baby and say hello to their neighbors. Uh, of course, the health craze and walking that was that has grown stronger by the decades here. Um, a place to go out and, and have a walk uh, in the evening. Uh, and they wanted to see sidewalks. Uh, our city council was very responsive in recognizing that fact and have moved to appropriate money uh, every year to improve those sidewalks, to meet some of those demands of the, of the community at large. Uh, we currently are budgeting just for new sidewalks about uh, $500,000 a year. Uh, our program to, re to rehabilitate and renovate sidewalks uh, represents an expenditure of about $300,000 a year. And of course, we do pursue grants when possible. So I mean, our, our total commitment here is approaching a million dollars a year to improve uh, um, the ability for the pedestrian to walk someplace rather than drive every place. And uh, we get to the downtown area here. The city won a Main Street Award for the National Trust. Right. Uh, what did you do to deserve that distinction? Well, what uh, this this really this effort started in uh, in the mid 1970s. Uh, the street that we're standing next to was a traditional four lane road uh, going through the Main Street, going through the middle of town. Uh, that was narrowed to two lanes. Uh, we uh, incorporated uh, angled parking, a, a very aggressive landscaping program, uh, widened out the sidewalks, and provided uh, places for people to walk and talk and schmooze. Uh, in the process of these last 25 years, a, some, a significant number of restaurants and entertainment facilities have come to the downtown area. So you'll see uh, on virtually every block the ability for outdoor dining. And of course our South Carolina summers and, and springs and even early falls are very conducive to outdoor dining. Um, so we've really improved the appearance and, and the warmness of downtown. And uh, this downtown is, is rapidly becoming a 24-7 downtown. Uh, you'll see people on the streets uh, virtually every night. Uh, and you know, up until uh, uh, midnight, to one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, on some occasions. Uh, we also, as part of that effort, uh, have encouraged downtown housing. So we have a substantial number of people who are now coming back and wanting to live downtown because they want to be close to performing arts centers and sports and entertainment venues that are within easy walking distance of downtown. And today, you're up in Charlotte meeting with other people, discussing uh, some of these sorts of issues. What sort of exchange of information and ideas is going on between different cities in the Carolinas? Well, we, we made a trek up to Charlotte today to meet with our counterparts. Uh, Charlotte's got a, a good reputation in some of the urban landscaping, streetscaping that they've pursued over a number of years, um, particularly things like uh, curb lawns and, and, and uh, landscaping opportunities in the downtown area. Um, that was one thing we were looking at. The other one was uh, in a mature community like Greenville or Charlotte, uh, when people want to live in a certain area, uh, many of the most attractive areas have been developed already, or the easier areas to develop. So people are pursuing uh, lots, spaces, um, a half of acre here, a quarter acre there. Uh, of areas that have been passed by, typically because they're difficult to develop uh, for storm drainage purposes or transportation purposes. But typically that's referred to as infill. Those are very popular pieces of land and so you have a number of people coming into the community to develop those infill areas 
and typically the old standard subdivision overlay streets a certain width and that don't work in infill projects so we were up visiting charlotte uh, picking up some of the tips and the ways they approach those infill projects and how they have been working to bring their downtown area uh, to uh, a much more attractive environment uh, particularly as they deal with their streetscape if i come back to greenville in 10 years 20 years what are you going to accomplish for pedestrians? Well, I hope uh, in that period of time, I don't know if I'll be here, but in 20 years, but in that period of time, uh, I would hope that you could, uh, if you choose to, you could walk from literally one end of the community to the other in a safe, uh, attractive environment. Uh, that's really, if there's a major mission statement, that's it. Uh, now, we have situations now, even with our program only being uh, six, seven years old, that from a number of our neighborhoods, and I'm talking probably a mile and a half, you can walk out your front door and be on a well-constructed, level, safe sidewalk and can walk to the middle of downtown now. But would like to see that extended through a series of sidewalks and trails so that virtually every neighborhood would have relatively good access to a pedestrian walkway system, I'll say that as opposed to just sidewalks, that would uh, get you to downtown and to other parts of the community. We're in Chestertown, Maryland, talking with Bob Chauncey with the National Center for Bicycling and Walking. What is the center? Uh, <laughs> it's the, it used to be called the Bicycle Federation of America. It's a nonprofit, 501c3. There's eight or ten of us here, relatively small staff, run by Bill Wilkinson, who's been doing that for the last 25 years. And we're in the business of uh, helping communities become more bike, bicycle and pedestrian friendly. Yeah. One thing you've been involved in recently has been um, some workshops. What are, what are the workshops you've been uh, involved in? These are called walkable community workshops, and this is the third year that we've been doing them, although they've been uh, occurring under other names, uh, shoot, for the last 10 years or so. Um, but uh, National Center for Bicycling and Walking started them uh, three years ago now. Uh, these are a series of workshops held in um, MPO regions. Um, typically we have eight four-hour presentations or eight four-hour workshops begun and ended with uh, meetings with uh, local officials and we talk about obviously how to make their communities more pedestrian friendly. We talk about uh, what other communities have done. We take them for a walkabout to show them uh, their area and talk about what kinds of things they uh, have done well and perhaps not so well in the past, uh, offer some suggestions and then put them to work to uh, uh, implement those suggestions. Yeah. An NPO or Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, is interested in this sort of thing. What is their role in, in getting this organized? I mean, what do they do besides just give you folks a phone call? Okay. Well, actually, they do more than that. They fill out an application, and, and um, uh, we're pretty demanding because we don't have the resources to handle everyone who wishes to have us come in and, uh, and do a series of workshops. Their role is to get their regions uh, excited about the need for and the opportunities for making their communities more walkable. And we, we talk about public health aspects and we talk about environmental health aspects of this. But we also talk about some nuts and bolts things like walkable communities make economic sense. Um, so once those uh, MPOs have gotten their regions excited about um, the concept of walkability and they fill out the application and we say you bet this is a great uh, community to do these workshops we send the um, MPOs at least one representative of to a three-day training session where we show them in more detail how the workshops are run um, and what makes a good workshop uh, who to invite how to get the right people there from every we, we handle everything from how do you get the mayor to show up to uh, make sure you have an extra extension cord and a three-prong plug and and all of that um, so once they've accomplished that uh, we send them back to their regions they do the dirty work they make the invitations up they do the logistics and then uh, we meaning a couple of trainers from ncbw show up and uh, spend a week with them you have a 
new variation on the workshops coming out uh, later this year. What's that going to be? Yeah, we do, John. It's um, um, a Safe Roots to Schools uh, workshop. Um, much the same format, uh, a series of four-hour presentations slash workshops. Um, the difference, the main difference is that the walkable community workshops tend to focus on, I'll call them hardware issues, on sidewalks and crosswalks and medians and, and pedestrian signals, um, with some focus on planning and zoning issues. Safe Routes to Schools um, is that, but it's, it's much more. It's how to get the community um, interested enough in the concept to allow their children to walk to school, to encourage their children to walk to school. You know, how do you, how do you overcome the, uh, the stranger danger? Uh, fear that uh, that many parents have. How do you overcome the uh, liability concerns that many principals have? How do you overcome the uh, the tendency of um, school bus drivers to say, "Gee, this doesn't seem like such a good idea. It sounds like you're going to take my job away from me." Um, so we spend uh, a fair amount of time talking about uh, these issues, how to get the community more supportive of. Um, uh, of, of allowing their kids, encouraging their kids to walk to school. Um, yeah. The, um, and you have this one week of intense activity. What happens after that? Okay. Well, quite frankly, it's largely up to the community. Um, you know, it's not, it's not our responsibility to improve uh, their communities. Uh, community leaders, residents, they have to do that. But what we do is follow up with the communities uh, over a period of months, regular phone calls, regular emails. Hi, how are you? What's happening? What, um, um, uh, how have you used the four, the eight hours, the week worth of exposure to these concepts uh, to your best advantage? What additional things can we do for you? What, what problems have come up? Um, where are the roadblocks? Um, do you want to invite us back to talk to the mayor, the city council, the planning board, um, uh, the chamber of commerce? What, what, what else do you need to make, to ensure that the lessons that we talked about are going to get implemented? And so again, we do follow up. We're not the, we're not a hit and run organization by any means. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.